great to see everybody here. Um, and it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. And our respect as well. You know, what we have. 30 stories worth of wire hose seems like a lot, doesn't it? Anybody wants to talk to Tom or I about what that looks like? Look at the penetration, look at the fire stopping elements we're putting in buildings. That's another sort of energy sustainable technology that sort of is great but works against us. It also burns the grass in my yard. Um, I'm Francesco Restuccia. I'm an academic at King's College, London, just 20 minutes away from here, um, and I run the Heat and Fire Lab. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to talk about fire safety incidents and failure mechanisms, not so much from the incidents, but on the different type of mechanisms and different type of batteries we have. Then I'm really going to focus most of this presentation on the safety challenges faced both by industry and what are we doing in academia to try and help a little bit on this. And the last bit is a few of the understandings we have gathered in the last five years in academia, and I'm going to focus a little bit on our work as well. So I'm a little bit biased there, but there's a lot of work being done. So fire safety incidents and failure mechanisms. This one is the cell that Paul showed you. So Paul showed you that fire from the an eighth of a Nissan Leaf battery. That's this one. So what happens when it fails? Um, you've seen the effects from Paul. So he showed you a nail penetration test. So you're just making one of the cells fail and then the rest thermally propagate. But we have many different type of failure mechanisms. Although once you reach thermal runaway, it doesn't matter what the failure mechanism was. Guillermo Rain has already mentioned some of these. You know, we have a lot of different industries that are affected by batteries going from uh, electric vehicles to, I think, the biggest issue as Guillermo's already mentioned stationary energy storage systems. And that's because, as Paul said, the elephant in the room for him is second life of batteries. A lot of the batteries that you would use in home and stationary energy storage systems might be batteries that are not as energy intensive for, let's say, electric vehicle applications, but that you still want to use because they still have some life in them. And I'll show you a little bit about that in the next slides. But why is it important? Um, Every single time I read the news, there's those big pictures of the fires I've shown you, but then it says only a small fraction are safety incidents. So let's say that a small fraction are safety incidents. Five years ago, we were producing about 8 billion cells a year. I think now we almost doubled that. Um, let's say that 0.00000002% of those have some kind of defect. That's still 140 failures a year. Now, you only need one battery in a battery pack to fail for the rest to fail. Battery packs range from the really small one Paul showed you with 32 cells to some that go up to 10,000 cells. Now, it doesn't matter how small the percentage is, if one out of 10,000 fails and the entire system fails, you have a very big problem. And that's because the amount of energy that each cell can release is very high. So you have relatively small amount from the decomposition that happens at the beginning, you get about nine kilojoules for that battery that looks like a double A battery, just a little bit thicker, the 18650. Um, and you get very, very small from the solvent. You know, those were the droplets that Paul was saying develop on top. But once you start having combustion of those gases, you can starting to get 90 to 100 kilojoules of energy being produced for each one of those cells. And the auto-ignition temperature ranges, but depending on the batteries, and I'll show you some numbers, but there can be very, very low, it can be about 450 degrees. So, you know, you have some temperature developing in those gases, 80, 100 degrees, then it gets up to 150, 300, and you have some of those cases where the gases in those videos are spreading and not igniting, but as soon as they reach 450, they auto-ignite. doesn't matter what um, amount of gases there are, and that's a lot of energy you're going to be producing. So what kind of failure mechanisms? Paul has shown you a lot of mechanical abuse cases, um, but there's also electrical abuse, and I'll show you two different examples. Thermal abuse, so that's something that's being exposed to a high temperature, um, and, it, and all of those will eventually reach an internal short circuit. Um, now, the important thing is not every single internal short circuit will reach thermal runaway cases. Some of them 
will stop. However, your cell, cell is still failed, and you might not know that. Your detection system, if you have 10,000 batteries in your pack, does not monitor every single cell. In fact, it monitors rows of cells. So if your row of cells has 100, it will know that in that 100, there's a small voltage drop. It will not know which battery it's caused. And so what the battery management system does is, if you're having an electric vehicle, for example, is it shuts off that row. It says, I'm not going to use the power of that row. I will use the other 99 rows. But if that cell starts developing gases and so on, your battery management system doesn't tell you that. It just tells you voltage. So you don't actually know what's happening in that individual cell. Some of the other cases lead to smoke, some lead to fire, and some, as Paul said, lead to explosions. So you, if you're developing enough smoke and it's spreading and you reach the lower um, explosion limit, um, then you will have an explosion. <coughs> now, what happens? Why can we have electrical failure? So in your battery, if you're overcharging the battery to the standard that it was designed for, um, you start having um, an expansion within the battery. So you start going to have strain on the surfaces. You're starting to have decomposition happening. First, the graphite starts intercalating more, so you have more intercalated lithium. Then you're going to have some dissolution. Um, and then you're going to start having decomposition. That decomposition just creates gases. So now you're going to have a big, big strain on your metal cylinder, whether it's a pouch or a cell or a cylindrical cell. And that strain will cause pressure buildup and buildup until either a safety venting or a failure of the cylinder causes the gases to uh, come out. The same can happen with over-discharge. So if you have over-discharge, you basically create mild internal short circuits. Um, and then those internal short circuits cause heat to generate. Overheating is another common one. Um, and this is a good way to show what happens. So you have, at the beginning, that SEI layer that Paul said makes that system slightly more thermodynamically stable really starts decomposing. So if that decomposes, now you have very high exothermic reactions happening inside. That happens at low temperatures in the 60 degrees, 60, 68, 69 degrees. Then the anode starts decomposing and the electrolyte. Then the separator in between will melt. Once that melts, you start having the cathode also decomposing. And all of those generate gases, which can be very, very toxic. toxic. So you have hydrofluoric acids, um, things that melt your bones, uh, um, and it starts producing its own oxygen. And that's why suppression is not always very easy because in fire often we say, well, we have the fuel, we have the oxidizer, we have the ignition source. This produces its own oxygen, so it has its own oxidizer. The fuel it's producing it has very exothermic reaction from all the internal material, and the ignition source can be itself, right? You're creating all these strains from the internal short circuits. So. This is just summarized that cells come in different sizes. So you've seen um, pouch cells. You've seen the, the one on the left is the usual um, one that you would get in very small applications. Then you have the cylindrical one. Um, and those have you know safety vents uh, and the steel shell. You also have the can. And you also have the pouch. And originally, the pouch was the only one designed for vehicles. And so the design of these structures was not necessarily done to then make these large modules that we then end up using for energy storage at home, for example. And from those modules, you then put them all together to make a pack. Now, I am not a chemist. I am an engineer. But I had to unwillingly look at chemistry uh, to understand a little bit more about batteries. And depending on the battery chemistry, properties really change. So LMO, LFP, LCO, NCA, and MC are all the sort of prefixes we use to describe all these chemistries, uh, LIMN204 and so on. Again, I'm not a chemist, but what I want you to see here is each one of those different type of chemistries will give you different properties. So if you want something that has very high specific energy and specific power, then NM NCM is great, so for example, a vehicle. But if you're looking for something that has less specific energy, but has a longer lifespan, then LFP is a great chemistry. So it really depends on your application what chemistry you end up using. Um, and some of them have similar properties. For example, LCO and LMO have similar behavior in terms of performance. But there might be different areas where they have less. So for example, cost is a main one. LFP has a much higher cost than, for example, NCA. And so when you put all of these variables together, cost, safety, lifespan, power, specific energy, 
then you need to find a compromise in each one. There is no battery that's great in all of them. There is no chemistry for the battery that's great in all of them. Now, the problem for me as an academic is, well, if I have a black box that's the battery, I have no idea what the chemistry inside is. Um, and so I might be told, um, and then I can look a little bit of information in the literature, but that's not necessarily the case. And at the end of this talk, I'll show you a few simulations on what happens when you change the chemistry. Now, what are the challenges we are facing, um, both in industry and what are we trying to do in academia? Um, so we did some work with Guillermo Rain and Professor Greg Offer, um, and we wrote a review paper about three years ago now, um, asking a lot of different industries on what challenges are they facing. And they told us that they're facing challenges on ignition and propagation, so understanding how that happens, the standards and regulations, detection and reliability, emergency response, and transport and end of life. What happens to these batteries when they're in passive systems and they're not being used? Um, so ignition, the challenges are manufacturing defects. Okay, that's something you can improve by improving the process. Um, however, the method that we use to drive these cells into thermal runaway to simulate those failure modes is not repeatable. Um, they change. Uh, so the experiments Paul was showing you from Spade Atom, as I was part of those experiments and as we were doing them, same exact setup, same exact batteries, we would have slightly different behaviors, right? So you have a tolerance error there. And there's no actual, st there are um, standards and regulations, that'll be my next slide, but there is no one reliable method for which all the time the cells will fail in the same way. Um, Crash-related ignition, complicated. Propagation, complicated. Standards, again, they're not representative of the real world scenarios very often. They lack harmonization on testing criteria. There's one standard for overheating a battery, one for overcharging, one for one type of geometry, one for another. Um, you're doing all of these tests at component level. Sometimes you're only looking at the anode or the cathode of a battery, or sometimes one cell. You're never doing it for the whole pack, right? And so understanding how that behaves is not easy from a standards point of view. And aging is a huge problem. So batteries, as you use them, will behave differently. So the curve of charge and discharge of a battery will change every single cycle of the battery. And how batteries age is dependent on the temperature of its environment, is dependent on the charge rate or discharge rate that it's being applied to. And this is why I'm very worried about home storage or standard or second life by use of batteries is you don't have a history of those batteries. Tesla is great at getting data on everything they do, but for example, if you're a user of a battery and you don't have all the data and you don't have all the instrumentation, then you take that battery and you decide to use it in something that's less power heavy and power <laughs> intensive, you have no idea how it's going to behave because you don't know its history. You don't know its aging history. Um, and that's also known as state of health sometimes. So if you read the state of health on the battery, that just means how has the battery aged? Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US, on the 15th to the 17th of April, 2024. Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available. The tall and high-rise building fire safety management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high-rise buildings. It is a five-day intensive course with world-class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com Now, I don't usually do standards. However, um, I was asked uh, to join uh, BSI, uh, the British Standards Institute, on Second Life uh, because they had no one from fire. So I agreed. Um, and I was horrified because, again, I have very little experience with standard. You have lots more experience than I do. But there is almost nothing on Second Life. Um, and there's almost no standardization whatsoever yet. Detection is a big one. So how do you detect those failures? Um, I'll show you from some experiments that, you know, often what you use to 
control those batteries is voltage. And sometimes, even if a battery has failed, the voltage will stay the same for quite a prolonged period of time. So you might have a crazy scenario where your battery is engulfed in flames. However, the voltage signal doesn't show a drop for maybe 40, 50, 60 seconds. The experiment I'll show you will be 90 seconds. So how do we detect it if our systems use voltage or strain rate or temperature, you're going to have different criteria. So what are what a kind of data we have? Usually we're limited to surface temperature and voltage, if we're lucky. Surface temperature, not always. Um, emergency response, I'll skip because Paul has spent 20 minutes on that. And transport um, and end of life. I think Guillermo mentioned plastics and polymers. I think that's the new plastics, you know, is going to be batteries. How do we recycle? What do we do with the batteries? Um, for plastics, it was great. In the 80s, we produced lots of plastics. We didn't worry about recycling, and now we have all these issues of microplastics in the sea. Um, batteries, at the moment, we are relying on the producers to think about what happens at end of life. I find that stunning because, for example, for nuclear power, we would never do that, right? There is very, very strict regulation that says if you make a nuclear power plant, you are responsible for decommissioning, cleaning up, and the 30 years after you finished, what happens to that site? For batteries, we say, we trust your judgment, you produce the batteries, and hopefully they will be dealt with. There is, at the moment, very little on recycling. And so what happens at the end of life, it's a tough call for industry as well, because for them it's a cost, right? Anything that you need to add in will be a cost. Um, so I've stolen this from Guillermo, is the different layers that he showed you earlier, prevention, detection, suppression, compartmentation, exactly the same applied to batteries. And almost all the work we do in academia is at the small scale. It's on the left of this plot. We looked at the materials, we look at the cells, maybe, maybe we look at modules as, you know, a one-off, but we don't really look at the large, large system. And so I wanted to show you some of the work we are actually doing in the area. Um, so I mentioned the failures, and Paul showed you that a lot of those flames that are being generated from battery failures are one directional, and you can't really predict that direction. So these are some stills from those experiments that Paul showed you earlier, where we have a battery. It's producing those gases. Some of those gases ignite, and you have a flame in one direction. Then it stops igniting. Then it reignites, and then you have a massive flare as the next cell um, ignites, and those flares can vary in length. So there's a zoom in from the one I showed you earlier. That's a flame flare that has a length of two meters. Now, imagine you're in a parking lot. What's the distance between two cars? Half a meter? Now, two meters means you're going to the next car and the one possibly afterwards, right? Um, some of those others, not the one I show you in the picture here, some of our other experiments, each one of these dots is uh, an experiment we did. Some of those are three meters in length. So you have these massive unidirectional flame uh, flames that maybe are not lasting very long in time. They might last 30, 40 seconds. Some of those were a minute and a half but up to three meters in length. So they can really have an effect if that is sitting below you in a car and that flame direction goes up, what happens to the passengers inside the car? Now, the mixtures vary. Um, however, you almost always have these high exothermic reactions, which will give you very high rapid heating rates. And so something that we really need to consider is safety distance design. Um, there's not much on safety distance design because when we design for battery failure, we try to design for detection maybe or for suppression, but what happens during is also a big issue. And at the moment, I have not seen standards. Maybe someone can correct me, but I have not really seen any safety design standards around that. Now, I briefly mentioned that I would show you some things about detection. So we did a lot of experiments. Um, and throughout all of those abuse experiments, the voltage of those cells was sometimes maintained and sometimes dropped. So what I wanted to show you here is this is the point where that hammer of 23 kilos that Paul showed you hits a cell. As soon as it hits the cell, you're starting to have some heating. So you're starting to have some heat. Um, and you start to produce um, some gases and some temperature increase. So here you see that the voltage drops as soon as it's pierced. And then the fire develops about 15 seconds later. Good. So if my detection system there told me that I was using voltage, I would immediately know about the failure well before the fire. And this is the flame areas that were developed there. Um, now, here's a second case. 
uh, the one on the right. Now the voltage is the, the, yellow, the red and the black. So now the red and the black are showing you that voltage is staying there. In fact, that voltage stayed for about 100 seconds. That blue is the flames that are there. So those are the exact same as the case where the voltage had dropped. But now in this case, we have flames of about an area, 0.6 meters squared of flame area, but the detection of voltage hasn't dropped at all because the voltage was maintained. Um, and we have a few different theories on why that is, um, and they're mainly linked to chemistry. Um, and I could read them out to you, but I'm going to say chemistry related. Um, but the implication from, for me as a fire scientist is I cannot use that as my sole detection method if it can fail in some cases and not other cases. And so if the voltage doesn't drop, what kind of detection do we have? What kind of detection do we use? Almost all the batteries that you see in big modules have a battery management system, which is basically something just to control the voltage, the current, the use, to make sure that you're not deteriorating the batteries, because batteries will always deteriorate. You can only control how fast they deteriorate. But that battery management system almost always relies either on voltage and current, or sometimes a few surface temperatures. And so that's not a very useful system if that's not the only uh, failure method. You might, for example, want to consider strain, right? If you have a cylinder and you start seeing strain from gases that are being produced, that could be a good um, other detection system. But of course, every single detection system you add has a cost. And what about the cases of no ignition? Um, so again, from those videos I, that Paul showed you, I took three stills. This is one of the cases where the state of charge of the battery was low, and so actually the gases did not ignite. Um, this is 35 seconds after the penetration. This is 50 seconds after the penetration. These are extremely toxic gases that are just coming out, and this is because the door is open. If that door was closed, then they would be building up inside, and you might end up having an uh, explosion, a vapor cloud explosion, just like the case before. And your emergency responder might not know what this gas is. It's smoke comes in, but it's not smoke. It's hydrofluoric acids and it's all that crap, as Paul called it, that comes out of the battery as it's, relax as, as it's reacting. And here's some of those gases. So you have hydrochloric acids, you have sulfites, you have um, hydrocarbons being produced. Now, what about quantity effects? So this is some work that Guillermo, myself, Schwanze, and Zenwen did at Imperial on batteries that are passive, so in transport or in storage, so are not being used, but are still reacting. Now, there's a phenomenon called self-heating ignition, which is just when internal heat generation due to low temperature chemical reaction is higher than the cooling of its environment, and that causes thermal uh, runaway to happen and ignition without any need for the battery to be active. So let's say you have a warehouse storage and you have one of those cells. Okay, if you have one of those cells, we did the calculations, both experimentally and numerically, the room temperature should be 160 degrees Celsius for it to ignite if the battery is perfectly healthy by pure self-heating ignition. Now, hopefully none of our houses will ever be at 160 degrees, so that's safe. But what happens if you scale it up? So what happens if now you have a rack of shelves of batteries in that warehouse? Well, then the temperature goes down to 60 degrees. Now, 60 degrees, might not happen, um, a slightly a bit too high, but what happens if you're not having perfect condition batteries now? So what happens if your batteries are not low charge, perfect state of health, might be slightly aged, then that number significantly drops. Or what happens if the packages where they're stored in has plastics, for example, to make sure they don't move? Now that would be a heat sink for those batteries where that heat is being retained. And so again, that would drop this value. And we've done some work to show that if you change the materials of storage, that makes the value even lower, and you can get down to 38, 40 degrees. Now, here in Britain, well, summers are getting hotter, but I don't often see 38 degrees. But if I go back to my home in southern Italy, I get temperatures of 38 degrees on occasion. My parents ask me, they have solar panels on the roof of their apartment building, and they ask me, oh, we want to put battery storage in the garage, um, because that way we have it at night as well. I said, no, 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 like here in the summer, it gets very, very hot. I would not trust this uh, um, because you don't know where those batteries came from. You don't know what their life is. You cannot monitor the deterioration. So unfortunately for them, they still pay the electricity at night and at the daytime they have the solar panels, but it's just not there from a detection point of view yet. 
And this is some work from Hossein, who's sitting in the first row, one of my uh, PhD students, um, on how do we actually model those battery failures. So I promised you that I would talk to you about chemistry. So we were really curious to see what happens if we change those chemistries. So what happens if we take um, the vented gases coming out of a LCO, LFP, and NMC module, so we change the chemistry, um, what happens to the cell? So this is a, a modeling rendering of the flames that would be developing from those gases. Um, and what Ozane did is he tried to understand what the jet flame propagation emanating from that battery from different chemistries would be and what different type of suit volumes they would produce, so what difference between carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide ratio they could produce so that we could think of some detection method first. Um, and second, how much variation is there? Now, the ignition temperature for each of these chemistries changes. So what Ozane did is he's taken a lot of data from the literature, he's used it all to make simplified chemical kinetics and then compare it to the real values from the literature. Um, and this paper is in review, so I don't have all the details, but it's to show you, to reassure you that ourselves, groups in China, uh, groups in the US are looking at some of these phenomena. And yet, even at an academic setting, we still don't have a full answer to these questions. And that's just for the three most common chemistries we study you know, in academic labs. There's a lot of other chemistries that are currently being tested that we have not done much data on. So what can we do before the fire happens? Um, this is something I'm very interested in is, okay, want to learn a lot about the fire side, but what can we do to understand those complex thermal effects before we get anywhere near a fire scenario? And so what we did uh, in collaboration with Warwick University um, and Jaguar Land Rover uh, through an EPSRC Prosperity Partnership is we tried to make a model that takes the chemistry that the electrochemists produce um, and we use it as a source into a thermal model where we then try to understand how the heat fluxes through a pack would change. And we can look at aging, we can look at temperature, we can look at charge and discharge. Um, and we try to develop a physics-based model to integrate all of the electrochemistry into the thermal model to then use it for cooling strategies. And now I put back on my fire science hat and uh, I say, okay, now we have this for a cooling strategy. How can we use it as an input also into our fire models? If we want to provide a fire model like the one Hossein did that I showed you in the previous slide, how can we be sure that the input that we put into these models is accurate or useful or as close to reality as possible? And so that's some of the work that we've been doing. Now, where do we go from here? Um, we really need to do more to understand Different chemistries, definitely. What happens at the different state of charge? What happens state of health? But we need to do this collaboratively. A lot of the work that was being done in the battery world or in the regulations world has always focused on electrochemistry, which is great because electrochemists are the ones who make the batteries. But fire engineers have been not really into that equation, into the discussion a lot. Industries, for example, um, the emergency response industry was not in the discussion until relatively recently. So we really need, one, database of more lithium-ion battery fire. So for example, the London Fire Brigade has started doing that for the last three years. We need to look at more suppression mechanisms. Paul Christensen mentioned earlier that there's not one that is you know, universally seen as functioning. So we really need to look at that. We really need to improve detection. We need more than just the battery management system, current inputs for detection. Um, we need multi-scale approaches to prevention. Prevention is the biggest uh, sort of weapon we have to fight this from happening, we really need to look at multi-scale approaches to that. Um, and I have kept a time. I have 30 seconds left. I just wanted to give you some references and just acknowledge that the work I'm showing you, I'm presenting to you, but it's not work done solely by me. In fact, a very small part is done by me. So some of this work, especially all the work on self-heating, was done at Imperial Haze Lab in Guillermo Reins Group. Um, a lot of the work on the electrochemistry that I showed you earlier was done at Imperial College Electrochemistry Group. The hazard explosions were done at Newcastle University with Paul Christensen. Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing now on um, thermal was done in collaboration with EPSRC and WMG. And finally, the Faraday Institution has finally funded a fire scientists, so I have funding from Fire Day Institution, uh, to look at fires for batteries through their SafePad project, which we just started. So I wanted to acknowledge them for ac acknowledging that fire science is a big player now in the battery uh, world as well. Uh, and uh,
sites and added... Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US on the 15th to the 17th of April 2024. Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available. The tall and high-rise building fire safety management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high-rise buildings. It is a five-day intensive course with world-class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com.